Welcome back. This time we're heading to North Africa. Why? Because we want to make a what if Cromwell. I have a, a, a box of old models, if you will. And oftentimes I try to figure out what to do with them in terms of where they fit in the big scheme of things. And, and I've got a few of the Tommy Cromwells, which are, honestly, they still hold up. They're beautiful kits. Uh, for the money, it's hard to beat them in terms of just kind of their fit, their engineering. They're fun to work with, uh, the quality and stuff. But one of my favorite topics is British North Africa in terms of armor and actually aircraft too. Uh, I really like the Mediterranean campaigns in particular. And there's no reason that we can't attack a what if in, in this genre. Oftentimes we associate that with Panzer 46 or, you know, a lot of the paper Panzer stuff. But truth is, you know, creative model building, uh, it's part of the core of what I find so endearing about the hobby. And I felt, well, this would be a fantastic opportunity uh, to do a desert project. I didn't have a desert kit per se. I mean, I didn't have a Crusader or, or a Grant on hand, but I do have a couple Cromwells. And I'm like, well, you know what? Let's go for it. Part of what this project was also about is a little bit of color theory. And, I, and this is kind of the opening round of how Rinaldi attacks color for scale model building. And it's it's a quite a bit different conversation that you see going in the current vernacular of a lot of black primers and stuff like that. And the reason for that is black's a dead color. And I need a lot of you guys to understand that if, you're, if your goal is to improve your color veracity, the, the impressions of color on scale models in particular, you need to start understanding color theory to really break down and go backwards and figure what you're trying to do. In this case, what I was doing is I used kind of the, the factory red primer, which I extrapolated out a what if story. Okay, this factory is painting in red primer. They were not doing green before they sent to North African straight camo. So there would be a, a LRDG pink. It's a desert rat, eighth army. So they went pink over red, boom, done. The point of that though is what I tried to do with it is to take that theory of what color does, what a color underneath a top color does, and then paint that together in the combination of the two. The importance of it was I really wanted the warmth, rich North African campaign to come through with the paint. If I painted the pink over the black, you're gonna get a grayed out neutral pink from that result. So that's the, the, the kind of the color theory at work, so to speak, in a very simplistic manner, but two colors, easy to understand, also easy to implement. Second to that was I, I leaned on Mission Models paints quite a bit on this project, namely because of how this is chipping, which you see here in the last few minutes. Mission Models paints has a real fantastic ability to take a lower level color in the similar technique application of hairspray, but without hairspray. And if you put a lower color underneath it that is impervious to water, in the case the primer was impervious, doesn't come off with water, you can then spray mission on top and then you can chip it with the brush and some water and you get this really nice kind of softer more human style weathering which is what i was really going for i didn't want a ton of hard flaky chips i wanted the pink to be rubbing and worn off from the grit the grind the grains of sand etc in combat and all that good stuff so that's kind of what was going on in the streams in terms of color conversation in the lrdg pink the goals of it why we chose it etc etc Second to that is I had a set of Fruel model tracks, which let's take a moment of silence because I don't know if you've heard the news, but they are closing shop and we're really sad about that over here at RSP because we are probably the world's number one provocator of, of Fruel model tracks. <laughs> probably can say that with some authority, right? Um, if you know, you know, I've been using them for, for 25 years almost and, and absolutely just, you know, Fruels are my thing. So sadness aside, <clears throat> What is the big conversation you guys love to ask me about, right? What is it that you always ask me about? Now, those, those boys on my Patreon, link in the description down below, will already go, they're already yelling at me, hey, Mike, do you use varnishes? <laughs> so let me explain this one for you guys one more time. Okay, decals. How do you do decals over a matte surface without them silvering? Big question in the hobby. And we'll get to the painting part of this in a second. Just follow along on, on the captions, it's pretty simple. But decals, <clears throat> setting solutions, lean on your chemicals when you're doing your decals. What I believe to be the problem with silvering in the, in the collective of, hey, I put decals down at silver and I, I didn't do a gloss. Okay, you don't need to do a gloss. Can you? Yes. Does it work over gloss? Yes, perfectly well. 
It also works perfectly well over a mat if you really lean on your solutions, your setting solution and your softer solutions or whatever they're called, whether it's Gunzi's Mr. Setter, Mr. Softer, uh, Tommy's own decal solutions now that they've offered in the West and uh, the common one here, at least in the States, is the micro, uh, micro scales, micro set and micro saw, which is what I use predominantly. Um, I have no problems with them affecting the paint. They don't bother the paint in my regard. When you watch it, everything that I've done, I don't have any paint disasters in terms of, hey, my mission came off with the setting solutions. Well, put your, put your setter down first, get your decal on, let that sit up for a minute. And the key tip, the pro tip for decals, while you continue to watch me hand paint tools, is make sure you compress the decals down with your, with your cotton swabs, Q-tips in the States. But you know wherever you are in the world, roll your decals out with your cotton swabs. What you need to do is you need to press the decal down and the associated wet glue into the solution onto the paint. And that forms it around the surfaces. And if it's a matte paint, there's subtle textures in that, whatever it is. And you can see there, they, they hunker down fine. There's no silver in anywhere. And then what I do at the very end, to answer everybody's question, I do a little spot varnish of it with a matte coat and that's it. I just do it right around the decal only and I don't mess up the rest of my paint. And I'll explain that later as we weather. And I've talked about this for, for years now, to be honest with you guys. It's all in the books. It's on all the streams, it's on the Patreon. You know, the way I weather is over a matte surface. And you need the tooth and the grit to do all the pigments and the OPR properly. So our desert rat is ready to weather. We've got it painted, we've got it chipped, we've got the markings on, the, the road wheels are painted, the tracks are, are pretty much ready to go almost. We'll get into that in here in a second, here we go. The tracks are, one side was done uh, for Patreon and the other side is we're gonna, we're gonna show you how we do that particular group of processes using uh, everybody's favorite life color rust set. Uh, I just use a sponge and some water, thin it down, dab it on. This is into the burnished for a model track. So the burnishing, consider your burnishing is kind of your primer base coat for your tracks. Um, modern burnishing fluids tend to be too even in my opinion, in terms of their, what they leave on the residual. And again, if you're very familiar with me, you'll know that the old school black in it and the Fruit model conversation, again, rest in peace. I'm so sad. <laughs> I'm like super bummed about that. Um, I wish there was something I could do about that, but I can't. But looking at track reference photos, extrapolating out the grit and the grime that comes from that uh, look is important. So the sponge is really key with this when you start to layer up and kind of get the colors in here. I needed a little bit more arid climate and the rust tones work with the warmth of the desert pink. So I went with kind of a pinkish rustier tone, kind of a brown pink, if you will, a little bit of the embedded dust. And that's kind of where I was going with all the track conversation. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Use a sponge, uh, works great in that regard. But to the matte paint conversation, again, same with decals, same with pigments, same with OPR. You need the tooth and the grit to really pull off a lot of the looks, at least the stuff that I generate. So if you wanna follow along with that, then I recommend you just do what I say in terms of that. Just throw your matte paint down and get the stuff going and don't sweat all the other conversation because you just, you don't need to. That said, one of the, the nice tips to do um, with pigments is when you, when you brush it on the surface, when you use your airbrush to kind of fix it down there, turn your airbrush pressure way, way down and you can kind of spit that fixture down into it. It gets a real nice gritty look and it sets those pigments in place. But what I wanted to demonstrate for the people on stream was, because the other question I get a lot is how do the oils work with the pigments? Or vice versa, or through them or over them, you know, layer them up and how do you do that? So this particular fender section, I really kind of go through and extrapolate out that process in terms of, I lay down a dust color with the oils, next to panels with dust colors of pigments. And I kind of just showcase you guys how I do that. And then to reinforce all the OPR conversation that you have here on this channel is, I work in a very simple, easy to manage light to dark system. I get my dust down first and then I come back in and, and, and I have a real simple color here. It's not, I don't need 50 colors in between. So my light to dark is really kind of going in from a, from a dust color and then getting some kind of rust tones into this in terms of the exposed kind of worn steel. And when I make the transition from a wet diffused application for the dust over to the sharp crispy rust application, unload the brush, use your paper towel. This is a critical step. Um, you can't do any of this without paper towels. It's probably the most important tool uh, we have, one of them anyway, top three. And what I do there is I showcase how you unload the brush properly to dry brush. And that's, it's really what you see me do. Notice I use the side of the bristle. I let it skip across kind of the, the, the radiuses of the fender and that, 
grabs the paint and, and puts the rust down in the same spot that it would happen in real life, which is from the crew and you know the, the, the tow cables being dragged over and stuff like this, you know, loading up with gear, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of the whole point of this. At this stage, we're, we're well past the what if. We're just kind of weathering a desert tank and demonstrating how to do that properly with the dust layer, followed by some darker rust and some exposed steel. I don't want super orange rust though. You know, you can see I'm going with kind of that real dark oxidized look that you get when you look at desert, you know, conversation. And having lived in Vegas and stuff for a short time and being from Los Angeles, you get real familiar with kind of arid climate rust. You know, it's not a bleeding conversation. We're not up in Maine where it's, it's high moisture content. This is, you can expose steel, it immediately rusts overnight and, and that's it. You just get a little spot of it or with the color of it. That's kind of how I play that up. So, but to do that, to do the little spots, to do all these little gritty things, one of the things I, I really wanted to showcase in this particular project, you see me speckle mud, uh, dust and mud and stuff quite a bit. What I really wanted to also express, uh, because I talk about it in the books too, is it works really, really good for what I just talked about with that kind of spotty, uh, kind of gritty rock thrown up into the paint, causing these little rush chips to happen randomly kind of all over the place. I wanted, how do you do that without hand painting those exactly? Because hand painting stuff, the thing with hand painting chips or, or spots like that that are hyper small, you know, pinpoint accuracy, it looks like a human came in with a giant hand and put a, a spot down. It's often too big. We're kind of clumsy with it. It's hard to do it in that general modeler, average modeler conversation. Well, how do you do that easily? Speckling. And you saw that here and you see, you'll see it here. You see the speckling it with the dust. You see me speckling some rust stains on there. And then I just take some of them and I just adjust the, the size and opacity and I kind of compose them a little bit, try to keep a natural look to the to the already randomness that, that happened with the, with the speckling. So again, control and precision. This was in the recent video on the Tempest. Uh, it's a big part of the conversation you saw in the P61 videos as well in terms of stream content and pulling out the information. Uh, part of the reason for doing all this edited, you know, really poorly shot live stream. So I do apologize. However, we'll, we'll, we'll get some 4K stuff coming up pretty soon for the channel in terms of edited 4K video. So I'm excited about that because I'm getting tired of the grainy 1080p because it's not 1080p. It's like 495p with the, with the download compression. It kills me. But what I really want to hit home for you guys in particular with this little section of the video is control and precision. Use your tools properly. Try not to bump the camera. Apply the color, blend it, tell the story. And that's what I'm doing here with OPR. It's, it's super simple. I work light to dark. Even in within Rust, I'll work a lighter tone first, blend it in, and then it'll dry so rapidly you can come back over with a slightly darker tone. It's all in the palette. And when you guys watch me stream and you see it in the books, it's very intuitive. You can see there, slap down a much darker tone, switch to the blender. Uh, I'm talking about something on the drive, <laughs> dry sprocket, I don't want to mention it. But just kind of taking, see the bristle, how sharp and crisp and tuned that is, and just tweaking that around to give it a real natural kind of rusted edge to the, to the back fender area, which would be one of the more beat up parts of the, in terms of paint wear and tear and location on a vehicle. It's kind of that rear, you know, the track's going to be turning that way, so it's going to be throwing stuff up at it. Uh, it's going to be an easy spot to climb on and off in terms of, you know, the crew, etc. But to reinforce the rust speckling, one of the tricks I used uh, in Tank Art 4 in the grill, and I'll showcase here in a second, uh, to get this look here on camera, to replicate that look. Uh, this is a pretty similar vehicle, actually, Panzer 38 in the Cromwell chassis, are quite similar. Um, so it really plays its hand well in terms of, I don't have a lot of mud here, so I've got a lot of exposed paint, but it's in an area that is just gonna get chewed up like a bulldozer. It's just gonna get ruined by whatever's going on in terms of its, its terrain, uh, you know, the rocks being tossed up against the, and this is probably mellow. To be truthful, this is probably really conservative wear and tear in this particular, this is the rear dry sprocket area of a desert tank at a light color scheme. So, uh, but the speckling of the rust kind of puts it down in a natural way. And all I do then is color by numbers. Like I'm just chilling, talking to you guys on camera. I mean, this is, this is super easy. Speckle some rust stains down. Um, and, and you control your speckling by controlling how much, just like everything else. How opaque or how translucent you want is all controlled by how much thinner you apply with the paint. So just always remember that when you're trying to get like a darker, more strong color, use less thinner, more paint, etc. But another little trick, another pro tip, this, this video is loaded with pro tips. Uh, it's called a bridge and a bridge is simple device that you run a brush across that gives you a linear ledge to, to brace your hand with. 
And so I just use the stir stick and I run that brush right across and so on and so forth. So this is part one of the Cromwell. Uh, we're excited. Uh, I got a lot to show you on this one because it, it gets pretty fun after this. Thank you guys. Consider Patreon. We got a lot of stuff going on over there too. Appreciate everybody's time. I hope you all have a good one. Take care. Thank you. Later. Bye. See you. Okay, I'm out. Peace.